Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for FAA's How to Create Diversity in Women's Leadership. This is going to be an engaging conversation with dynamic women who lead in various functions and at various levels here at the FAA. I'm Abby Smith, Executive Director for Aviation Policy and Plans and your moderator for today. We're coming to you today on Zoom and on the FAA's YouTube live stream. If there are any reporters joining us on live stream, please note that all the discussions today are for background only. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, let's initiate a live feed from our one and only Deputy Administrator, Bradley Mims, who's gonna provide some opening remarks for us before we get this discussion rolling. Brad, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Abby. And it's good to see you and it's good to see everyone who is here uh, participating in this event today. And uh, I can honestly say that I am truly, truly honored to be here with all of you to celebrate Women's History Month. Now, you know, this year's national theme, <clears throat> providing healing, promoting hope, in my opinion, is spot on. And I will tell you that it, it made me reflect back on all of the women who have been very, very important in my entire life. And you all know, you know, your mother, your grandmother, people who are part of your family, uh, other relatives. I had a cadre of wonderful aunts. I had a cadre of awesome people who were in my life, women who were in my life uh, as mentors, uh, coworkers, and people who just gave me guidance and direction throughout my entire career. So thank you and my hats off to all of you. <clears throat> it's a recognition that many women offer healing and hope, whether it's caretaking during COVID-19, building bridges with others, mentoring in the workplace, or in countless other ways. At the FAA, we're fortunate to have successful women at all levels of the agency. And again, I reflect back to Jane Garvey, who was the first women, woman administrator and someone that I had the pleasure of working with for a time during my first stint here at uh, FAA and the US Department of Transportation. But think about others. We just lost to retirement, Terry Bristol. <clears throat> we now have Shanetta Griffin, who is now running the Office of Airports. We have Angela McCullough, who is the acting number two in, this, uh, in the uh, air traffic organization, as well as Angela Neal, who is our new head of HR. And, uh, and we have Jeff, Jess, our chief of staff. All of them are doing remarkable and magnificent jobs. At the, uh, today's panel is a chance for us to hear from them. And, how we can accomplish and benefit from uh, greater levels of diversity and inclusion throughout the agency and in the aerospace community. <clears throat> the FAA's most valuable asset continues to be our people. We need to hire and support people with diverse perspectives and backgrounds. We need to build a fully inclusive work culture where everyone feels accepted, respected, Anne Heard. I want to say a little second, a little bit about Anne Heard. I have heard from so many people who don't get heard. They can be sitting in the front of the room and saying the same thing that others say, but for some reason they get shut out and they're not heard. That's not right and it will not continue. We must achieve equity by doing better to include people who have traditionally been left out and our workplace needs to be fully accessible to people with disabilities. As we commit to achieve these results, we will fully benefit from everyone's unique talents, skills, and perspectives. We'll make a workforce that looks at things from every angles, every angle, makes better decisions, innovates at greater rates, and solve problems faster. Here at the FAA, we've seen the benefits of diversity when we had a team of people from with different backgrounds come together to craft the FAA's Flight Plan 21, 
our strategic uh, plan to continue our success in the coming decades. We've also seen the benefits of diversity when the FAA has worked with our labor partners on air traffic control, safety, and modernization programs. We've seen these benefits in countless ways and we'll hear more examples of it today. Again, as we continue to build diverse and inclusive teams, we will be in a better position to meet the many challenges we face in the aerospace community. For instance, we must continue to modernize the national airspace system with new technologies and procedures that bring greater levels of efficiency. We're working to safely integrate new and emerging vehicles like drones, rockets, advanced air mobility, and supersonic transport. And we have to do this work in a way that achieves environmental sustainability and equity throughout the entire aerospace system. The efforts we make to build a diverse workforce will determine our success in meeting these challenges. Now, as an aerospace community, the opportunities continue to grow. We're working on ways to connect young people from diverse backgrounds to potential careers in aviation. We're looking for new pilots, air traffic controllers, drone operators, aerospace engineers, and aviation maintenance technicians. We're also going to need professionals in data analysis, cybersecurity, program management, communications, and countless other areas. As a part of a diverse workforce, we want more women to consider careers in these spheres. It's no secret that aviation has been a primarily male-dominated field. Now, in the FAA, women make up only about 24% of the entire workforce. And again, compare that to the US population where men and women are about an equal number, 50-50 or so. Uh, and you know, you might get a little, you'll, you'll see a, a number of women here in headquarters who are in very, very significant positions here at headquarters in Washington. But once you go out into the country, that changes dramatically. It's essential that we reach out to young women and girls from all backgrounds and walks of life. And I will say from my own perspective, my own granddaughter, I am kind of pushing her and guiding her to think about fields in the aerospace community. And my, my daughter's working with me to do that. So we're very excited about what we can do to uh, drive her into uh, technical areas that uh, would benefit our community. We also want this field to be attractive to women who may be considering mid-career changes or maybe jumping back into the workforce after a, hi a hiatus or layoff related to COVID-19. This month, we look forward to receiving recommendations from our Women in Aviation Advisory Board, which will help us improve the agency's outreach to women. Attracting diversity is only part of the solution. We need to create an environment where everyone feels accepted, respected, valued, and included. And we need to make this a place where everyone knows they can fully contribute to our mission. And we need to provide mentorship and professional development at all levels. As we do these things, we will reaffirm this year's Women History uh, Month national theme to provide healing and promote hope for all people. I'm looking forward to, the, to today's discussion panel. Let's apply what we learn and continue to build diversity and inclusion throughout the aerospace community. Again, thank you for having me this afternoon and I look forward to and whatever you can do to promote diversity, include women, in the workforce, please do step up. Have a good one. Thank you so much, Abby, for having me today. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Brad, that for that wonderful welcome and that charge to us. Um, and welcome again, everyone. Each March, our nation celebrates Women's History Month to recognize the achievements, 
of women past and present in the United States. From the beginning, women have been an integral part of American airspace. For 2022, just to reiterate what Brad has said a couple times, I'll double down. The FAA's Women's History Month theme is providing healing and promoting hope, which is so apropos as we move forward from this unprecedented pandemic into an endemic and look to returning to whatever a new normal might be. I want to begin by sharing what we do here at the, FAA, at the Federal Aviation Administration for any of you that aren't part of our wonderful family. The FAA is responsible for maintaining the safest and most efficient airspace in the world. We regulate all aspects of civil aerospace in the United States, as well as adjacent international waters, including air traffic management and airport construction. We were established in 1958, and the FAA is part of the Department of Transportation and operates in all 50 states and all U.S. territories. We employ more than 45,000 employees in various occupations. Approximately 70% of our positions are technical, and they include positions like airway transportation specialists, engineers, aviation safety inspectors, personal security specialists, data scientists, computer specialists, drone operators, economists, pilots, doctors, and air traffic control specialists. In fact, I started my air traffic controller. Wow, it feels like it was yesterday, but it was actually 31 years ago. These are just a few of our top mission critical occupations. However, we also have many other occupations that are equally important to our, our amazing mission. They include human resource specialists, lawyers, management and program analysts, and equal employment opportunity professionals, and many more. In fact, we basically have a position at the agency for just about every position under the sun. But regardless of the position that anyone holds here at FAA, our continuing mission is to provide the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world. I am inspired by the women of action on this panel, ones who break glass ceilings and work to create a more inclusive, creative, and innovative environment, not just for their own employees, but for everyone in our aerospace community. I'm gonna introduce each panelist, and then we'll discuss how they are driving diversity in their leadership. As we move through today's event, feel free to put any comments and questions in the chat, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Okay. Now let's introduce the speakers. Bring on down Aaron Ballard, Branch Manager, Aviation Safety Office of Quality and Integration Executive Service. Aaron began her career at the FAA in the Office of Civil Rights as an administrative assistant in 2009. Wow, how she's, how she's blossomed. In 2010, Aaron became the Equal Employment Opportunity Specialist and Outreach Program Coordinator in Civil Rights, which sparked her interest in promoting diversity equity, inclusion, and accessibility. In 2013, she joined the um, Aviation Safety Branch of FAA as a Diversity and Inclusion Program Manager. And in 2016, she was awarded the U.S. Department of Transportation's Secretary's Meritorious Achievement Silver Medal for her work in, in AVS's, or Aviation Safety's, Diversity and Inclusion Program. And then in 2018, only four years ago, she became a branch manager in aviation safety. Here in that glass break. Next, please welcome Migdalia Gonzalez, FAA's Hispanic Employment Program Manager from the Office of Civil Rights. Migdalia serves as the Hispanic Employment Program Manager. And in this role, she, collab she works collaboratively to increase and support the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts of the administration. She previously served in a leadership capacity at Housing and Urban Development's Office of Housing, where she managed the development and execution of training for the largest program office. Additionally, she represented HUD during disasters around the country. What a great mission. She's the recipient of the Gears of Government Award for her outreach events after Hurricane Maria. Gracias. Prior to her federal government career, she was a realist in real estate and mortgage industries in the private sector where she was credited with creating the first minority real estate franchise. How awesome. 
Our next amazing woman is welcome Zena Wen. Zena is the performance management team manager of the air traffic organization. Zena started her federal career working as a student intern during the summers and winter breaks following her freshman year of college. Her undergraduate Bachelor of Science is from Purdue University with double majors in industrial relations and management accounting and double minors, because if that's not enough, in computer science and women's studies. At the time she attended, the woman to men ratio at Purdue University was one woman to every 20 men. Then she attained her graduate certificate from Johns Hopkins University as a skilled facilitator. She's worked for the Department of Transportation's Office of Inspector General for 15 years, and then joined our FAA family in 1998. Um, so in addition, what's really cool is not only does Zena Hewen care about her day job, she's also given of herself as the national president of the National Asian and Pacific Americans Employee Association. She represents FA employees of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander heritage. Thank you, Zena. Next on this amazing lineup is Angela Neal, our Acting Assistant Administrator for Human Resource Management. With over 20 years of experience, Experience in human resources and business administration, Angela provides executive leadership for developing, managing, implementing, and evaluating the agency's HR policies and programs for all of our employees across this wonderful nation. Prior to joining us, she served as the Chief of Human Resources Policy and Performance Management at the Department of Homeland Security's U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and she began her federal career as a U.S. Presidential Management Fellow at the National Institutes of Health. Welcome, Angela. Um, last but certainly not least, come on down to Lethea Thomas, Deputy Vice President of Management Services in the Air Traffic Organization. Talithia, um does all kinds of things to help us here at the FAA. She oversees the prioritization and distribution of the Air Traffic Organization's financial and people resources. She provides technical labor relations advice. She improves processes in technical hiring, providing leadership employee development, and she strengthens organizational effectiveness and employee engagement. She served in a variety of capacity, capacities within the Department of Defense as a budget analyst intern, strategic human capital division chief, and deputy chief of staff. At her tenure at the Department of Treasury, she was also in the Office of the of Inspector General in the Financial and Program Auditor and a manager overseeing financial management um, policy development at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. So Talithia knows how to show us the money. She holds a Bachelor of Science from Old Dominion University and a master's degree in public administration from Troy State. Welcome, amazing panelists. So let's get this party started. Panel, have you ever been the only one at a meeting who looked like you? What did it feel like? Angela, would you kick us off? Yes, thank you, Abby, and good afternoon or good morning to all of you. Uh, first, let me start by thanking the Federal Women's Program for the opportunity to be with this amazing panel of women. Uh, and to connect with all of you here today as we celebrate Women's History Month and the role women have played in society. So to answer that question, absolutely. I have been the only or sometimes one of a few uh, in a meeting, on a team, or in the room for much of my life. And initially, I have to tell you, it was intimidating and uncomfortable uh, because I immediately started to focus on my difference as a deficiency or maybe even a barrier. I was concerned about the possibility of validating stereotypes and feeding into the perceptions of, you know, not just being a woman, but also for me, it was about being a woman of color. However, uh, as time went on, I saw it as an opportunity to change perceptions. I remained intentional about how I was showing up and looked for ways to add value. Um, I also had to realize that it was not my responsibility to fix others' biases 
but I worked to be strategic in ensuring that I avoided the consequences of it. And so I continue to focus on excellence, doing my very best and allowing my work and my interactions to really speak for myself. Um, also, uh, I'm just really grateful that we as women are seeing a shift uh, happen. There has been a lot of uh, history making moments uh, in recent years. And while there is still a lot of work to be done, uh, we are seeing more and more women in those meeting rooms. And sometimes we're sitting at the head of the table. And so that is significant progress. Uh, my advice to others who may find themselves as the one, as the only or one of a few is that you take this time to not dim your light, but use it as an opportunity to demonstrate preparedness, to look for ways to add value and be confident enough to eliminate other women. And what I mean by eliminating, uh, illuminating, excuse me, illuminating other women, what I mean by that is taking the theme in its literal sense of providing healing and promoting hope. And hope to me means helping other people excel. Thank you, Abby. Uh, Angela, thank you. That, that was an awesome opener. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn now and Talithia, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you the same question. Have you ever been the only one in a meeting who looked like you? What did it feel like? And uh, can you give us some thoughts? Yes, absolutely. Uh, again, thank you for this opportunity and uh, not to repeat what Angela uh, mentioned, but I shared some of the same experience. Um, what comes to mind uh, for me is throughout my career, especially having worked in three departments, Department of Treasury, Department of Defense and Department of Transportation, I was one of one of few or the only in meetings on various work groups. Uh, what comes to mind is my experience early on as an auditor with the Department of Treasury Office of Inspector General. One of my first assignments was to observe the inventory process of seized assets for one of the law enforcement bureaus. And traditionally law enforcement personnel are, are white males. My job was to observe and document their inventory process. When I arrived at the entrance conference, they were very surprised to see a young African-American female. Some were um, uncooperative, some were very dismissive. I felt very uncomfortable. So during the break, I actually called my leadership team and express some concerns, but they empowered me to continue with the meeting, to continue to lead the meeting because they knew that I knew the process. So after speaking with them, I went to the restroom, I got myself together, I looked in the mirror and I said, I belong. I know, I know my job and I just need to be myself. So I went back to the meeting, I clearly articulated the process, I clearly articulated what the expectations were and my role, I clarified roles and responsibilities. And when I tell you by the end of the first day, they offered me tickets to a major league baseball game. Some invited me to their homes for dinner. And it was, it, it was just a, 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 change, a change in the of events. So for me, I realized it can be very uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter if you're the only. You have to be confident in your ability to do the job, do the job well, because you belong just as much as anyone else. Thank you, Talithia. I love that. I belong. We belong. So um, I'm going to now ask the same question to Erin Ballard. Erin, have you been the only one in a meeting that looked like you? And tell us about that experience. Abby, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, and I would say, especially when we were meeting in person, it's been the norm for me to be the only person who looks like me in a meeting room and that I'm a woman. And I'm also a woman with a disability. Um, you can't tell on a virtual platform like this, but I'm a full-time wheelchair user. And so for me, um, I would often be the only woman wheelchair user in the room and often the only person uh, using a wheelchair at all in the room. And so at times it has made me feel like perhaps no one could relate to me in the room. And it's also felt sometimes like I was underestimated or I think as Talithia said, use the word dismissed that sometimes I could be um, dismissed or my voice not heard in the room. 
Um, on the other side of that, I will say that it has also felt like it's given me a unique opportunity to share my perspective as a disabled woman with people who otherwise might not have ever heard that perspective. So for me, that's been something um, that has been very meaningful to me. Um, and so, as I said, you know, it's an interesting experience for me over the last couple of years as we've been working virtually. You can't see my wheelchair in this virtual platform. And so it's taken me a while to adjust to this idea that my wheelchair isn't the first thing that someone notices about me when I enter a meeting room. And um, that's been positive in many ways. And so I think that working virtually and working in different environments has opened up a lot of opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, and I think it's been an excellent reminder for me personally that whether the room is a physical room or a virtual room to enter that space with a consideration and a thought for everyone, to give everyone space to share their perspectives and have their voice heard. Thanks for the panel. Right. Erin, that's awesome. And I know when you and I were talking um, this week and you shared with me that you were in a wheelchair, I had no idea because I've only known you over Zoom. And, and I love this story and thank you for your courage and your leadership. Um, now I'm gonna turn to Magdalia Gonzalez and I'm gonna ask you the same question about have you been the only person in the room and what your experience was. Thanks, Medelia. Thank you, thank you all. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to sit with these great women. Um, I started early in being the only one. Um, most people, when they first see me, they're like, oh, she doesn't look a stereotype to be a Latina. Um, but at the age of 14, I received a scholarship. And if you can't tell by my Southern accent, I'm from, the Bronx, New York, and uh, I went to East Hampton, Massachusetts, where I was not only the only Hispanic in the school, but in the entire town. Um, and my first day there, someone literally came up to me and said, we don't need your kind here. And that was cleaning it up because we're on a panel. Um, but all I kept remembering and had in the back of my head is my grandmother. And she would say, you belong just like everyone else. And the opportunity was given to you, not because you are a Latina, but because you earned the grades because you executed when it was needed. And um, culturally speaking, I come from, as Deputy Mem said, uh, a whole line of powerful women who were firsts. So I didn't know any difference. Um, you know, it was about, okay, I'm here. So either accept it so we could work it out or move out of the way because I'm still moving forward. Um, and really it's about this hope of how do we make it better for the next generation? How do we provide and be supporters of one another in order to move forward, right? We don't live in this world alone. It is about how can I support Aaron? How can I support Zena? How, Abby, what do you need me to do? Um, and as women, we just have this ability to get it done. It doesn't matter the title. What do you need? You need us to care. What is it that you need us to do? And how do we do it effectively together? And I think that is a, a distinct skill that we as women have about okay, life is hard, we gotta work it out. And what do we do next? You know, We can make nothing, something out of nothing. And, and that is something that uh, I credit to being a woman, right? We just have to learn how to dance. And we have to slide to the left, slide to the right, and work it out, figure it out, and let's move forward. So thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Zena, I would love to hear your thoughts on being the only and what that felt like. Okay, so for me, it is not unusual for me to be in many different meetings and situations where I'm the only female and definitely the only Asian person because I chose to go to engineering school and there were small classes and I'm the only one in the class and everyone kept saying, why are you trying to be in a male profession? And I was like, this is not a male profession, dear. I am here with just as much capability as the rest of you. So. Hey, all my teachers told me I should have been a math major. It just comes naturally. 
when I went to the IG office, I said, IT audit, of course, everyone's computers, programming. I can do all that just as well as everyone else. And what's interesting is the men were more nervous than me in the environment. And they said, oh, do we need to be more careful, open the doors for you? Do we need to carry us? Like, seriously, guys, I can do things on my own. And when I was on the job doing the runway safety program, I loved traveling. I went up to Omaha, Nebraska, and this guy came running up to me and says, oh, I've never met an Asian person before in my life. And I'm like, okay. And it's unusual for a woman to be in this job. You're traveling up here on an evaluation of the airports? And it's like, yeah, um, how am I different? So I thought that was kind of interesting. You can actually enlighten other people. That poor gentleman, he's an engineer in tech ops, and his mother was Japanese and left his dad. His father's American. So he had never seen anyone outside his whole life that was Asian. So that was neat. So I say it's a matter of just being comfortable with yourself and making other people comfortable with you. Thanks, Abby. Yeah, Zena, that gives me, that's just a kick. I, I literally, um, for this meeting, went over um, to Lund Plaza, which is nearby here in D.C., to grab some lunch. And there were two men I was walking with, and I opened the door for them, and they they stopped. I said, it's okay. I'm a modern woman. I'm going to hold the door for you. And they both kind of giggled nervously. And, and it was this great moment of, hey, let's um, let's put aside um, traditions and let's just all be in this together in, in a very egalitarian way. So um, let's dive in deeper. So creating diversity in women's leadership is, is really not something to comply with or a way to be politically correct. It's how we achieve our most pressing goals because diversity of thought brings new and fresher ideas. Now, I'd like to ask all of you viewing, this is for all of you out there in viewer land, uh, to please put your thoughts on this subject and any questions in the Q&A box. This is gonna help us keep a lively discussion going and address your ideas as time permits. Talithia. Can you give us an example of how you leverage diversity to bring about innovation in your career? Yes, uh, throughout my career, I've been, uh, I've had the opportunity to lead startup organizations um, and also transform teams that had low morale and low productivity. Um, according to Gallup Strengths Finders, a ranger is one of my top five strengths. And so that means that uh, I have the strength to magically marshal or arrange resources for optimal efficiency. And um, I have some uh, logistical finesse, as they tell me. So I've leveraged diversity to bring about uh, innovation by assembling diverse teams and work groups to address leadership challenges, as well as just get things done. So my strategy is to look for diversity and knowledge which means having a balanced personnel with institutional knowledge as well as those from an outside, from the outside, um, especially since I've moved around and worked for different organizations, having an outside perspective is very critical. I look for diversity and skills, which means a combination of the mission critical occupations. So for the FAA, it will be like your air traffic controllers, your technicians, your engineers, as well as support personnel, whether it's HR, finance, uh, IT, et cetera. And there's also diversity in experience. When you pair your senior personnel with less experienced personnel, because that provides you with varied perspectives. And then also what's, what's key these days when you have a, a dispersed workforce is geographic dispersity, disperse, excuse me, geographic diversity, because that mitigates the risk of having geographic bias. And what that means is we strive to have a good mix of both headquarters personnel, as well as those from the field. By doing so, um, these parents have actually sparked innovation and creativity, um, diversity and thought, diversity and recommendations that create success with some of the most um, complex issues. And we're starting to see this manifest itself by um, the structure of Flight Plan 21. Uh, that is our, our, our strategic plan, the HC strategic plan, and it's created for us by us, by a group of diverse individuals across the agency that have diversity in those areas that I, that I just mentioned. Thank you. Um, that was great. So I'm gonna to turn to you, Migdalia. 
What are some creative ideas that you have for how to develop diverse leaders for the future and for succession planning? Well, I, I created a little acronym, so I, it's the AAA. So I assess where I'm at. I assess my audience, who my customer is, who my colleagues are. Um, I go up, down, because I need to know who I'm servicing. Who am I going to outreach to? The second is I acknowledge the differences, right? Because at the end of the day, and my third is you never assume, right? So I never want to assume I know how someone else thinks or how someone else processes information because we are all different. And that is what makes us so unique and what makes us so wonderful, right? We all have something of value. However, what we need to do is acknowledge what it is and figure out how best to tap into that talent. And so, for example, one of the reasons that I received the Gears of Government Award was because during disasters, most agencies are, okay, let's just throw everything out. out. Let's just, what is it that the people, they don't ask. They're just like, okay, here's some money for food. Here's some money for a hotel. Here's some, and I said, Ooh, time out. What is it that they really need? And so with that concept, I created what we call disaster recovery fairs, where I bought the services to one location. So that way the impacted individual can get the services that they need in one stop, right? They lost their homes, they lost their cars, there's no bus, there's no infrastructure. How do we get them? No, we get them together in one location, but I also did it as a holistic approach. It's not just about the material losses, it's about the well being of those impacted. We are human beings. And as such, we need to take the time to assess who we are, who they are, acknowledge it, and, and accept the differences. Not everyone's going to agree, but what we can do is agree to figure out how to effectively serve one another. And then, of course, never, never, ever assume. And so um, being creative and innovative is super important because of the melting pot that we are. And so that is extremely important to take into account, to just take a moment and pause, assess where you're at and who you're dealing with, and then make the adjustments from there. Thank you. So Angela, I'm going to ask you a question now. So... First, congratulations on being the head of human resource management. I'm really happy for you. I'm not surprised, uh, but it's really cool. So what steps are you taking in your role as the leader of human resources to empower our workforce and increase our bench strength of diverse talent, especially women? Thank you for that question, Abby. Uh, having just joined uh, the FAA in October, uh, as the Deputy Assistant Administrator for HR Management um, and now uh, serving in this acting role, I have been encouraged uh, by the number and the, the activity of the employee associations, uh, the affinity groups, and uh, the emphasis the agency has placed on diversity. And, and we've, we've seen that through just the sponsoring and the opportunity to have events and conversations like this where we're able to celebrate our diversity and uh, have important conversations. And so I am thankful to the leadership for just creating that space for us. And then just for everyone uh, being able to participate in that. I think that's very uh, important. I think it's an opportunity for us to forge a path forward in creating a work culture where we do all feel a sense of belonging. Um, as the HR uh, head, um, I have the honor, as, as you mentioned uh, in my bio, Abby, of providing the executive oversight for the full life cycle of, of our employees. So from recruitment to offboarding. And I'm thankful that HR, uh, the, the um, Office of Human Resource Management, um, has already established very strong partnerships with these internal employee associations, as well as the external uh, professional associations. And I'm, I'm proud of the work that our team does in recruitment and outreach of not just women, but all groups to ensure we have a workplace that is representative of the people we serve. Uh, we are consciously working to build our talent pipeline, 
Um, we have the Minority Serving Institutions Internship Program, which is our, our flagship internship program here at the FAA. And our university relations team uh, has an outreach plan for the spring that includes 30 colleges and universities that have large women populations. Yeah. That's, that's quite impressive, yes. So the other thing that I've been doing, uh, Abby, since joining FAA, I've been co-leading the agency's diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility uh, steering committee in partnership with the Office of Civil Rights. And this group, which is comprised of, again, uh, representation from across the agency. So it's not just leadership in a room deciding what diversity and inclusion will look like. And it's not just a, you know, just a small working group we have solicited participation from across the agency. And so this group has come together to make recommendations to leadership on how we can work collaboratively to promote a workforce culture where all employees can help advance the mission of our organization. And so while HR plays a key role in recruitment and uh, I am certainly committed to building our bench strength, I believe we all have a responsibility for bridging the gap between what we say our commitment to diversity is and what we see and experience in our day-to-day -day, uh, workplace. Thank you, Angela, that was great. So Zena, I, you're up, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. How have you leveraged diversity to help others grow, develop and contribute to our amazing mission here at FAA? Okay. Thanks, Abby, all right. I wasn't expecting to be next. Okay, let me first start with reiterating the FAA mission. Our mission here is to ensure the safe and efficient travel across the nation and beyond. We want to be the world leader in aviation. And given our mission is to ensure secure skies across this diverse nation, it only makes sense that the workforce that's responsible for fulfilling our mission reflects the nation that it serves. So we want a diverse workforce. And our inclusive nature here is defined by our values. We are continually seeking employees from all backgrounds and distinctive ideals, perspectives. When I hire people, and I've hired, I've been very fortunate to hire a couple of people this past year for my team. I look for people with different skills than we already have on the team, looking for different insights, different ways of thinking. Because technology and systems are going to continue to evolve and to meet the aviation challenges of tomorrow. We need that diverse workforce. And as Angela has said, the FAA is really good about actively working to support and engage in a variety of associations, programs, coalitions, the initiatives to support and accommodate the employees from a very diverse community and background. We always say our people are our strength and we take great care to invest in and valuing them as such. And so it is everyone's job. Everyone in FAA can help find our successors. Succession planning is critical. There's MSI interns. There are many positions open. I know airports is like hiring 200 people this year. So let's reach out to our friends, connections, colleges, high schools, encourage the young ladies to pursue the STEM fields in any field. FAA has jobs for everyone. Okay. Thank you. So Aaron, so Again, thanks for sharing your story uh, of, of what it feels like routinely in person to be the only, the only in a room. You have been a champion for so many. Can you share with us what are some specific ways that you've advocated for change for persons with disabilities and some successes and challenges that you faced? Yeah, thanks for the question, Abby. Um, so one way, um, is that I have been open to sharing my experience as a disabled woman. I think everyone has their own comfort level around what they're willing to share about their own experiences and their perspectives. And I think that's okay too. Um, so just speaking personally for myself, something that's been really meaningful to me is that by sharing my experience, I feel that I've been able to make connections with people, um, given myself an opportunity to learn from them and given them an opportunity to learn from me. And so that's something that's been really meaningful um, to me in my growth as a, a person and also a, a manager. Um, and then from a branch manager perspective, uh, part of what my team does is, and several of the panelists have also um, talked about this, but is um, engage in outreach with candidates with 
possibilities and forming them about the career occupations that we have. Um, and part of that too is doing early outreach at the younger ages um, to encourage girls and girls with disabilities to in, in, uh, pursue fields in aviation and STEM. And so um, it's meant a lot to me to have that experience as a manager now to lead a team that does that work. Um, and so I, another thing is that I've tried to share information um, with my disability community network that I have as well about hiring authorities for people with disabilities. I remember when I was looking for an opportunity, I wasn't aware that there were hiring authorities out there that existed to bring people on board with disabilities. And so now I have the, I think, unique experience of having gone through that as an applicant who was looking for an opportunity and now also a hiring manager as well. So it's sharing both of those perspectives for me um, that I, I've tried to spend a lot of time on and focus on. Um, I do think there are a lot of challenges. I think that we can all do a, a better job of continuing to reach out to, um, to women, to women with disabilities, to share what we know and our experiences about uh, being going through the hiring process or our experiences at work. Um, and specifically for hiring people with disabilities, I think another important part of that is educating ourselves as hiring managers around our responsibilities for reasonable accommodations. That's another part. Um, I think that gets to the includes in this part is hiring is just the first part of it. Um, and then the next is how do you really accommodate people with disabilities and make sure that they're included and able to do their jobs just like everyone else. So thanks for the question. Oh, thank you, Erin. That was, that was really insightful. So um, in her book, Everyday Genius, A Guide to Peaceful Leadership, author Wendy Knight Agard states that the first step to diversity comes from within. And that if you cannot embrace yourself, including your flaws, that your ability to embrace others is compromised. As an example, if you dislike something in yourself, you'll have a, dis you'll have a tendency to dislike it in others. This is an example of unconscious bias um, that um, does not, that, that really impedes a, uh, adversity. So think about this. As I and I and, and I'm going to throw another question at each of you um, around this. How do you embrace all that you are, your perfections and your beautiful imperfections, and use it to bring others along with you? So Zena, I'm going to have you go first on this one. Okay. First of all, I'm going to say that you need to be kind to yourself because as we get older we realize we're human, okay? If you be kind to yourself and you believe in yourself, you can carry that on to being kind to other people and encourage them to be confident in themselves. And people that are confident are more willing to take risks and do a lot more. As a NAPA president, my executive board, the first time I was president, I've done this a couple of times, my executive board member says, you're calling yourself a chicken? And it's like, okay, um, it's not a bad thing. I like being a mother hen. I have a whole flock of chicks that are willing to follow me <laughs> and they grow and they develop and they're safe. And I'm really, really proud when they get promoted and they make a do accomplishments. We should be shouting from the rooftops because when one person succeeds, everyone succeeds and everyone looks good. So that's something I really encourage. My team members, uh, I am very blessed with amazing people. I'm fortunate I got to choose the last couple but every person's unique and they're all professionals. So I basically get out of their way. They put me in a cage and they say, Zena, when we need someone to do the fight, you're the pit bull. We pull you out and you go do the fight for us. Okay, you make the decisions. And I was talking to my mentor the other night and she says, Zena, you realize you do get in front of the bull with a red cape on? Do you realize how often you do that? And she says, a lot of other people are introverts, they're too shy, and you take that on. So I'm a little bit crazy, but I want to get the job done. So <clears throat> when you ask me why people follow, you have to have the passion and you have to be genuine. And when you can communicate that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I need to drink, but people matter and people feel when you're genuine and you care. And they follow. Thanks. So Angela, I... What about you? How do you embrace 
all that you are, perfect and imperfect, and use it to bring others along with you. Yes, thank you, Abby. Um, well, first, let me just state that I am perfectly imperfect. Um, and I, I had to grow to be okay with that. I think, um, you know, as, as young girls, we want everything to be perfect. And while we continue to strive for perfection, uh, perfection just isn't always possible. So I had to be okay, um, which means that I embraced, who I, I embraced who I am today until I get to where I want to be. And so part of embracing my flaws is really self-acceptance. Um, and so not from a position of complacency or comparison, but uh, from a position of contentment with the understanding that I'm a work in process and I'm continuing to grow and develop into the woman I was created to be. And so I'm continuously learning and growing. And as you all know, uh, in this social media filter crazed world that we live in, uh, it's so easy for me to compare my life and my journey to the next person's um, uh, social media filtered version that they may post online or that they may show up in the workplace with. Um, and then I start to compare myself to, to their perfection, which isn't even in existence, right? So embracing for me means uh, has taken work. It's required self-reflection, uh, self-awareness. And, and part of self-awareness is, is really taking the time to think about your life and think about, think about your life as it is now Think about the life that you want it to be and working intentionally to create that life. And so that's part of part of uh, growing and learning and developing is really embracing um, and accepting who you are. And so I think the other piece of self-acceptance um, is also around working with other women who may be able to share their stories. Uh, I think what we're doing here today, having everyone share their stories uh, can be of help to, to other women as they uh, grow and develop uh, in their career. So there's a lot to be gained. And I think when we create safe places uh, for women to share how they made it and uh, for us to, to not just share how we made it and it's not enough for us to see how we made it, how others made it, but I think to share those sort of the backroom stories about you know, what worked, what didn't work uh, and sort of the mistakes that you made along the way. But I think that's important. Thank you. Talithia, you're up. Um, tell us about how you embrace all that you are perfect and imperfect and bring others along as a result. Thank you again, Abby, for a great question. And both Zena and uh, Angela actually shared some things that I um, had in mind. So I think I'm going to go in a different direction. Um, when I think about the question, so what comes to mind for me is I typically see the glass as half full and uh, see the art of the possible. So when I hear no, my first thought is, but what can we do? As long as we're not violating any laws, any regs or um, any ethical violations, surely there's something that we can do. We're in a society, as it was mentioned, where perfection is the standard. And the reality is we're not perfect. Actually, we are perfectly imperfect. So we should encourage one another um, our workforce, uh, and our personal lives to not fear failure. We should, because you have to start somewhere. So an 80% solution is better than no solution. When I think about some of the most uh, valuable advice, um, what comes to mind is for me, I recall coming to the FAA as a, as a senior manager and because I didn't have the air traffic background, a lot of times I didn't know where I, I didn't know where I fit in. I didn't know how to penetrate the system. I didn't know when to dial in, when to dial back, when to speak up, when not to speak up. So I would sit in meetings with a lot to say, but I will wait until I form the perfect response. Don't do that. The best advice that I was given was to find your voice and to use it. Think about why you were hired. Think about the value that you bring and use your voice to influence change. And so that's what, once I, once I finally got it, that's when I started to thrive in the agency. I started to, to, to use my voice to influence change. I stopped focusing on not being uh, a mission critical occupation as a controller or a technician. 
but started to really think about the value that I add, the value that I bring um, as a leader and, and, and just being a part of this organization. So that was the best advice. And I strive to create a safe space for others so that they can also embrace uh, diversity, uh, be able to share their experiences, to be transparent and to be their authentic self. Thank you, Talithia. And Magdalia, how about you? Tell us about how you embrace all of you and how that draws people in. I, um, I feel everybody has the potential and the, and the value of reaching their highest. Um, and my job, and I've always been raised that way, is my job is to help myself and others. That by me being a servant leader, by me helping others reach their best version of themselves, I in turn will reach the best version of myself. Um, I, when I first, I've only been here at the FAA six weeks, but prior to that, when I first joined the federal government, I felt like a bull in a China shop. Um, because in corporate America, you were bull. Either you were, you eat or you, you were eaten. Um, and being even in corporate America, in the position in corporate America with my team, I was the only woman and the only Hispanic. Um, so it was always very interesting. You have to build uh, a tough skin um, and that's okay. Um, but quick story, moved to North Carolina from New York. So you can imagine the culture shock. Um, and every Monday morning, you know, the, the folks who were from the South would want to know what I was doing. And I was from New York and I was like, why are you all in my business? <laughs> it was just, I couldn't figure it out. Um, and so it was a great opportunity for me to learn to Talithia's point that sometimes you have to make an adjustment, right? And you have to meet people halfway, right? You have to serve as an example of what, you know, for me being a woman and being a Latina, all that we are. And so you have to learn to be comfortable in your own skin and recognize that if someone doesn't really like you, that's their problem, not yours. And you can't control that, right? The only thing you can control is the choice you make every morning on how you're going to face the day and how you're going to react to something. And never allow or empower someone else to affect you in a way that negatively reflects you. And so that to me is super important. Um, and culturally speaking, I was raised by a whole bunch of women. So we were like, too bad. <laughs> well, thank you. That was that was fantastic. Um, Aaron, what about you? Thanks, Abby. So uh, this is still very much a journey that I'm on. So I want to thank my panelists here. I've made a lot of mental notes about the things that you've shared, and it's insightful for for me. Um, Zena, you know, you saying to be kind to yourself. <laughs> that that really um, hit me as a, an excellent reminder. And also to leave you not waiting to be perfect. So I, I thank the, the uh, panel because a lot of really great advice there. I think for me, the thing that I would add is just again, recognizing for myself that I'm not perfect. Um, and I think for me, where I am now is recognizing I'm not perfect, but, um, and that's okay, but to continue to challenge myself and to create a space for other people to challenge me and help me learn and a safe space. So that's the type of thing that we can share with each other with, with the goal of, of learning and growing and improving together. So I, I think that's where I am on my journey to embracing my imperfections. Thank you. So I think, I think I feel obligated. I haven't answered a question yet. And so um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer this question that I asked all of you. And so I mean, one of the things that, well, I was asking this question that was hilarious back about 10 years ago, I was with my mom and my brother and my aunt came over and she was very upset and she was crying and she was something that happened. She's like, well, no one's perfect. And my brother, who's so funny, yells from the other room what and so i got a kick out of it because it was just i mean it's just an obvious thing and and as women i think we do feel this tremendous pressure to be 
physically fit, to eat all the right foods, to be the smartest person in the room. But all we really need to be is us in the room, right? I mean, oh my gosh, uh, one of the, the one of the ways that I think that I draw people to me is I, I'm like, look, I make mistakes several times a day, and I and I usually when I'm in a room, well, always when I'm in a room. There, the the fact that there's different people in the room, they everybody else knows more about something than I possibly could ever in my whole life. So let me not feel intimidated because they're really smart about something that they can shore me up. I can help them in other ways. And I think talking about that often with people that I lead, with my peers that I enjoy spending time with, um, with my superiors, I think that's a way to empower other people to not worry about if they're not perfect or for, for goodness sakes, if they, if they fail on something. If it's a small F and not a big fail, there's learning in it. And so it's a reframe into, oh my gosh, thanks for unveiling that because we all had a chance to learn and we can make new mistakes that rise the tide with all of us. And as women, we can help each other to, to embrace the fact that, as Charlie says with shock, no one's perfect. So um, there, I had to answer a question. And oh my gosh, I just see it's 301. So as usual, the stimulating dialogue and the insights have really taken us uh, to the end quickly. I have to thank each of amazing panelists for uh, her time and dedication today and her service every day to this wonderful mission at FAA and to the United States of America. These are just a few of the incredible women who are part of, of the empowered women at the FAA. They all deserve and desire to serve our country, makes them role models for all women. Thank you, each of you out there in the internet land for joining us, especially our college and university women in the audience. I, um, I became a controller right after college and um, I saw it on the paper, I took the test. And I will tell you, I never expected that 31 years later, I would be a federal executive in charge of policy, strategic planning, forecasting, regulatory analysis, and so much more. It's been such an amazing ride. And it all started with just a spark of interest. Check out our e-blasts, our YouTube, our FAA Today, and our FAA's social media information on all the other Women's History Month events that include mentoring, inclusive language, and even mock interview panels. As we wrap up, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, oh, if you haven't heard it by now with the rest of the panel, FAA is hiring. Check out usajobs.gov or faa.gov forward slant jobs for all current FAA job openings. Aviation and aerospace provide an amazing career for every career that you could ever think about. If you have any questions of any of us, feel free to email outreach at FAA.gov. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Until then, stay safe. Bye. <laughs>